everybody. Um, I would like to say good afternoon. I, I, it might be a morning for you, depending on where you're at. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Emily Springer. I'm an academic trainer for the Center for Teaching and Learning. And I'm joined today with two of our very own librarians. Um, they will be presenting Google for School, Amanda Bizet and Marisha Kelly. And um, just a couple of housekeeping things. This, this webinar is being recorded and we will post it in our CTL LibGuides webinar page. And um, both Amanda and Marisha are welcoming questions. We are going to have all of the questions be in the Q&A section of your Zoom. And they will be addressing your questions at the end of the presentation. And for today's webinar, our chat is disabled. Um, so any questions that you might have, go ahead and pop them in the Q&A and we will get to them at the end of the presentation. I will go ahead and turn this on over to Amanda to begin. Thank you so much, Emily. We're so happy to be here. Thank you again for joining us for Google for School, Beyond Your Basic Google Search. My name is Amanda Bizet. I am a reference and instruction librarian. And I'm Marisha Kelly. I'm also one of the reference and instruction librarians with NCU Library. Just a quick rundown of our objectives today. Today, we will understand the differences between searching a library database and an online search engine, identify appropriate search tools within the Google suite of products, and be able to access research resources, including citations, abstracts, full text, et cetera, within the Google suite of products. And uh, I would like to let everybody know that we have created a LibGuide that corresponds to the content that we are presenting here. That LibGuide is called Google for School LibGuide. Uh, it has all of the content, again, that we're presenting. And additionally, after the fact, we'll go back and upload this presentation as well as our PowerPoint slides. You can access this guide by going to the library's homepage clicking on the library guides tab, which is next to the Roadrunner search, two tabs over, and there's a drop down list there. So you can select Google for school. And before we actually jump into all of those products and get to know uh, some of those techniques uh, for finding uh, re reliable sources of information, it's important to first have a brief discussion about search terms. And this pertains to whether you're searching within a library database or you are searching online. So we always recommend maintaining a list of search terms that you intend to use and building onto that list as you encounter different resources. They'll lead you to additional search terms. As you're building this list of terms, please consider synonymous terms. There's different ways to describe the same concept. Also think about how others would describe your research topic, including uh, scholars within the field. Uh, there may be additional keywords that they would use that uh, you didn't initially think of. Also think about outdated terms or terms that may not even be acceptable today, uh, but keep in mind that these terms may still show up in the scholarly literature. And for more information, we do have a keyword searching uh, libguide, which provides additional information on maintaining your keywords. Today, we're going to start with Google Scholar. I believe we spend the most time here with Google Scholar simply because it is such a valuable tool for finding academic research. So what is Google Scholar? As you know, it's a freely access accessible search engine. And from one place, you can search across many disciplines and sources, articles, theses, books, abstract, court opinions. And these are all coming from academic publishers, professional societies, online repositories, universities, and other websites. Uh, this is primarily a search of academic papers. Shorter articles such as book reviews, news sections, editorials, announcements and letters, which may be found in the academic uh, journals, may not be included here in Google Scholar. Let's first talk about the weaknesses of, of Google Scholar. Um, and 
So you may have your own ideas about why you, you may not necessarily be comfortable going into Google Scholar. Um, one of those is that they provide an overwhelming number of search results and unfortunately not a lot of options for filters and sorting. For instance, there are no limiters for full text. There are no limiters for simply a strictly peer reviewed journals as you would find in a library database. Additionally, the advanced search, which we'll see in Google Scholar is very bare bones. There's not a lot going on there. Whereas in the library's databases, you have a lot of bells and whistles built into that advanced search. The full text may not be available for all resources within Google Scholar. We do have a, a workaround where you can link to full text content in the library, which we will see. But for other resources that you find in Google Scholar that are not available online or, for, or through the NCU library, please keep in mind our interlibrary loan service. Uh, so before you pay for any content, always check with the library to see if we can retrieve that through interlibrary loan. Finally, the tool um, uses an algorithm to determine what scholarly-like materials should be included in the search results. Uh, there's no human beings here evaluating content for inclusion within Google Scholar. So therefore, it becomes extremely important to evaluate each resource. Um, let me go back and say you should be doing this regardless of where you get a resource. If you get a resource from the library, you still want to critically evaluate evaluate it, but it becomes even more important, right, when you're finding it in a freely accessible source like Google Scholar or even Google, which we'll talk about later. So this brings me to an example of where Google Scholar has really gone off the rails. And that is that they have at some point in the past, and people have captured this, which is where these screenshots have come from, these are Google search results, Google Scholar search results showing parsed out cafeteria lunch menus as author lists. So you can see in the upper left image, we have M sticks, BC wings, LG salad, LC salad. So those are the, the author's names, supposedly. Um, and then just for fun, I threw in the APA citations to some of these. So you can see in the image in the upper right that uh, mozzarella sticks is correctly um, put into APA format with sticks comma M period. So just a quick example of how Google Scholar is not always to be trusted, right? And that, brings us to a much more serious note. Google Scholar has biases because citation is a social and political process that disadvantages certain groups, including women, younger scholars, scholars in smaller research communities, and scholars opting for risky and innovative work. And that comes from the study that I have here below the image. Additionally, Google Scholar has been criticized for prioritizing English language publications. And in fact, a 2021 study found that the Google Scholar sorting algorithm renders research written in languages other than English practically invisible. So I thought that was a very powerful statement, uh, just showing that Google Scholar is not without fault and it prioritizes English language. And I do have that. Um, I do have that study as well. If anybody is interested, so we've seen some very startling and maybe even funny examples of why Google Scholar is not to be trusted. So then, why use it? Why should we invest our time and effort in using Google Scholar? Well, first of all. Um, I guess overall on a whole, it can lead you to resources that you may not have otherwise considered. If you're sticking strictly to the NCU library, you're missing a lot that is out there. Because Google Scholar does provide access to very valuable open access resources not found in the NCU library. In other words, the library um, is made up primarily of subscription 
databases. We pay for this commercial content. Therefore, we are not pulling into our collection that open access content that you can find in Google or Google Scholar. Within Google Scholar, some might say it's um, maybe easier to search because you can use natural language to search for relevant resources on your topic. That means that you could just enter terms that you would normally uh, use in conversation, right? Versus trying to think of that controlled vocabulary that you might use in the library database. Google Scholar, in my opinion, and I think others might share this opinion, is one of the best ways to identify highly cited literature. So that, in fact, is the primary way that I use Google Scholar in order to look for the citing and related resources, which we will see shortly. And finally, Google Scholar integrates with the NCU library in some very cool ways, which we will talk about. And again, sorry for a little bit of background noise <laughs> right here. I have a toddler. Uh, continuing on why we might want to use Google Scholar, uh, Google Scholar provides an organized and instant method for scholars to build on through a sort of digital snowball for literature retrieval. And so we'll talk more about this, but essentially what this means is that just within a few clicks of your mouse, you're able to get to those citing articles and those related articles, and then the citing and related articles for those articles. So you can continue building building and building upon your literature um, with these resources. And that might be a lot easier to do through a tool like Google Scholar than it may be through the library's search, such as Roadrunner. So let's go ahead and talk about ways that you can access Google Scholar. Um, most notably, you can go directly to scholar.google.com and begin searching your research topic by entering a couple keyword terms or your search phrases. But one thing I'd like to point out is that you can start your search in Roadrunner. And if you're not familiar with Roadrunner, Roadrunner is the NCU Libraries Unified Search Engine. So what that means is that it allows you to search the majority of the library's databases, resources, and content on a single powerful search platform. But again, when you're searching Roadrunner, you're searching specifically the NCU Libraries subscribed content. But like Amanda mentioned, there's a world of information that you know we just don't have indexed within our databases, right? It's physically and virtually impossible for us to have access to everything or record of it. So by using these extend your search um, buttons, you can easily translate your Roadrunner search to Google Scholar with the click of a button. One thing I will point out is that these extend your search buttons don't always translate more complex searches. So if you're using um, different strategies like phrase searching or truncation or even nesting, keep in mind that they may be interpreted differently by different search tools. So you may have to edit or tweak your search slightly. But again, you can start in one place and kind of keep on researching with your topic in another um, tool or database. We also have our 360 article linker, and this is generally found um, within search results within the NCU library databases or a Roadrunner search. Um, you may have come across this before, and for some of you, it may be ultimately frustrating because um, two things can happen. The first is that you'll either be routed to where this resource or where this article lives within an NCU library database where you have full access, or the second could be this middle screen here where you get to a page that says it may not be available within the NCU library and please use the options below to get it. So you can cross check Google Scholar to see if there's an open access or a publisher version of that resource that is freely available. And we'll talk a little bit more about this when we look at accessing search results within Google Scholar, but know that you can easily translate the title of that resource and cross check Google Scholar to see if it is freely available on that platform. Otherwise, as Amanda mentioned earlier, if you're not able to access a resource um, immediately, if we just don't have record of it, 
if you're not able to find a full text version that's freely available, we do have our interlibrary loan service. And this is where you can place a request um, electronically for any needed resources or content. So the following slides will go ahead and cover a quick tour of some of the Google Scholar features, including different facets and settings that are available from within the main menu. So here we have our main landing page for Google Scholar after running a quick search here on my topic, cybersecurity. Um, so you can see we have all of these different menu tabs. Now the default tab is the articles tab. And here is where you can search across multiple sources such as articles, theses, books, abstracts, reports, and more. Um, now what you'll find on your Google Scholar search results page is again, that bare bones type of searching. So in this case, I'm not able to um, further refine my results, right? I can only limit by particular uh, years, um, specific date ranges, and I can only sort my results either by relevance um, or by date on this page. Additionally, you can search case law through Google Scholar. So Google Scholar does allow you to search and read published opinions of U.S. state appellate and Supreme Court cases since 1950. U.S. federal district appellate tax and bankruptcy courts since 1923, as well as U.S. Supreme Court cases since 1791. Um, in addition, it does include citations for cases cited by indexed opinions or journal articles, which allow you to find influential cases, um, usually older or international that are not yet online or publicly available. Um, so again, you can toggle your search uh, to case law from within the menu in Google Scholar or on the main Google landing page. Um, you can select the radio button for case law and you can also search um, specific courts. Um, I do wanna make note here that if you are in a legal studies program or a law program, the NCU library does provide access to valuable legal research resources. So databases like Westlaw, High and Online, um, and Lexis. You're also able to search author profiles, and this is a great way to um, discover prominent researchers in your field of focus and also review a list of their published works. Um, so here we have um, a search for cybersecurity and associated professionals who've devoted uh, their research to this area of interest. And we're able to see a list of specific authors um, as well as access those author profiles to review a list of publications. And so if we click on an author profile, you can actually follow an author in Google Scholar to track and receive alerts regarding new articles, new citations, or any related research. So this is kind of putting forth the idea that you can have the database or a search engine do the work for you. So instead of having to consistently run searches related to this article, you can decide to follow this author um, and receive article updates, citation updates, um, and again, any related research um, that that particular um, author um, has cited. In our My Profile, um, you can create a personal profile in Google Scholar, which provides a simple way for you to keep track of your own citations um, and your own published articles. So here we have a screen a shot of Amanda's author profile. So you can see that it has her list of um, articles, which she's authored. She's able to see who has cited her articles. Um, it's also uh, an option for you to make your profile public so that it may appear in Google Scholar results when people search your name. One thing to consider with this particular feature in Google Scholar is that you do have to be signed in to a Google account in order to have access. So if 
you know, I hope everybody here pursues publishing opportunities. And I think this is a great way um, to keep track of things that you've authored and see how other researchers have interacted um, with your own research. So here is an example of my library. Um, so this is an opportunity for you uh, to create a personal collection of articles. So as you are doing research across Google Scholar, if you come across any related items, um, things that you find valuable, you can easily pin them to your own folders essentially um, by clicking on that star icon. Um, you do need to have a Google account to use this feature as well, but here you have a screenshot um, of my particular library where I've been able to organize things that I found in Google Scholar in different folders, and I can come back to them for future reading. One of my favorite um, tools or features of Google Scholar is the ability to create search alerts. And again, going back to the idea of having the database um, do some of the legwork for you. So this is an opportunity for you to find and stay current on your research topic. Um, you don't necessarily need a Google account in order to create search alerts and citation alerts. You can enter any email address of your choice. Um, and if the email address isn't a Google account or doesn't match your Google account, then you'll just get a verification link, um, just allowing you to start receiving these alerts. But essentially, if there is an article or a resource that meets your search phrase, your search query, um, Google will send an update containing a list of citations or related references, which we can see here. So. Um, here's my search alert query with cybersecurity and risk management. I've entered my personal email address and I can choose to create that alert. And here you have an example of what that email looks like. I don't know what your inboxes look like daily, but my recommendation, um, if you are uh, creating search alerts, which you can also do across multiple databases within the NCU library. So this strategy isn't limited to Google Scholar. You can create search alerts in Roadrunner, any EBSCOhost database and other databases across the NCU library. But my recommendation is to create a separate email for yourself and send all of those search um, alerts to that one inbox and maybe take one to two days a week to comb through um, these search alerts. And again, keep track of the research um, and stay on top of any new content that's being published related to your topic. Now the metrics tab is probably one of the more interesting um, features within Google Scholar. Um, this metric tab allows you to view recent citations to many different publications and it's also a way um, to help authors as they consider where to publish new research. So you're actually able to browse um, the top 100 publications ordered by their five-year H index. And an H index is just an author um, measurement related to the importance of a citation within the field. So you can actually see which articles in a publication were cited the most and who cited them. Um, you can click on that H index number to view the articles as well as the citations underlying those metrics. Um, and again, it's an opportunity for you to explore publications and research areas of your interest. So here I can click on categories and I can view some of the top journals in let's just say health and medical sciences or in the social sciences. So it's kind of like that digital snowball, right? We start with one click and then we're kind of discovering um, new forms of information related to our topic. And here we can access the advanced search screen. So again, with Google Scholar, you're not getting all those fancy bells and whistles, your multiple search boxes with Boolean connectors like you do in Roadrunner's advanced search page. So 
Um, you are able to apply those keyword strategies. So you can use your and and ors and phrase searching or nesting um, where you group similar terms together in parentheses, but really the advanced search is what you've got. <laughs> so um, you can enter your keyword terms as you see fit in some of these fields, some of these spaces, um, but most notably, um, on the advanced search, I do want to point out that if you are interested in looking up any publications, any articles related to a particular author, you can use the advanced search to return articles authored by a particular researcher. So you do have the availability to, to input an author name and see any related articles or sources. Um, on the same note, you can also view articles that are published in a particular journal. So if you notice a level of saturation where maybe there's a lot of interesting articles about your topic that are routinely being published and popping up in the same journal, then it might be helpful um, to do a search in that journal and return any articles published in that specific publication. All right, and here we have a recurring video. So um, the steps are not this long. This is just a recurring video, but you are able to connect the NCU library to Google Scholar to check for full text articles and databases. Um, so that being said, if you are on Google Scholar's landing page and you click on that settings gear, um, you can click on the library links icon and do a quick search for North Central University. So we'll give ourselves a minute to catch up here. You'll make sure that there's a check mark placed in that box and you'll go ahead and hit save. And the benefit here is that if you do use Google Scholar to do research, you can actually access or link out to content that is accessible through the NCU library for specific sources. So we'll take a look at that. Um, in just a moment here, but let's talk about viewing search results in Google Scholar. So again, when we talk about accessing articles um, from Google Scholar, there may be a version of the article that you can read and would be provided. So in the case where you have connected the NCU library to Google Scholar, as we saw in the previous slide, um, what you will see for certain results, if they are indexed and available within the NCU library is a full text at NCU link. So this should save you a little bit of back and forth um, and kind of give you that seamless sort of search experience as you're searching this particular tool and trying to access full text content. Um, in other cases, there may be links to open access PDFs or HTML versions of articles that are available to read for free, which have been provided either by the authors, publishers, or an open repository themselves. Um, in some cases, and this is not unusual, you may hit a paywall <laughs> when accessing a search result in Google Scholar. So um, again, friendly reminder, please, please, please never pay for an article. Um, you're more than welcome to reach out to us to cross check its availability, um, but you do have the option to submit um, a request through our interlibrary loan service. Again, if that article is not immediately available or accessible. And here we've come to our cited by links, which can be found underneath each search result within Google. And this is probably um, one of my favorite strategies for conducting research. So this can actually be an effective method, particularly when you are looking for the latest research on your topic. So that cited by link allows you to view newer sources of information that have actually used your older original article as the foundation for their research. So, you know, while we are always looking for the most current information, moral of this story is don't discount the old stuff, right? There can be value in some of these older resources. And when we talk about seminal works, right, landmark studies, um, pivotal research that has been consistently cited 
throughout the literature, there is value there. So these older articles, again, or older, older resources can lead you to newer sources of information. Um, so here I've clicked on the cited by for this particular resource, and you can see that everything ideally in this list is going to be published after 2012, right? Because they're referring back to my original article. You can also leverage Google Scholar's algorithm for finding uh, resources related to a particular citation by clicking on that related articles link beneath the search result. But again, very bare bones. So when we click on that related articles link, we are presented with a list of, you know, resources that are ranked by relevancy, but I'm not able to filter these results any further. So a lot of scanning on your part, although not that many results, about 101, which should be hopefully a quick scan. Um, but again, not a lot of bells and whistles to kind of filter through um, these search results and these pages. And here we have our site tool. So Amanda covered some of the mishaps that can happen with certain citations, but um, you are able to preview the citation of a particular resource by clicking on the quotation marks beneath each search result. Um, you are also able to export uh, content to RefWorks. So if you do use the library's research management tool, RefWorks, you've got a button there um, to send that information and save it to the tool. Um, you are also able to create a custom button to import directly into RefWorks, and this is actually in your settings. Um, so if you click on your Google Scholar settings and see the default tab for search results under Bibliography Manager, you can have a link displayed to show, uh, to show and import citations directly into RefWorks. Um, I will note here that it is extremely important to check your article citations and resource citations for proper APA style, since a lot of these citation generators and database citation tools are likely to contain errors. Um, so friendly reminder, our friends over in the Academic Success Center do provide access to Academic Writer, which does provide over 150 sample references as well as nearly 10 sample papers. And it does incorporate all of the references and other content from the publication manual itself. So don't discount that resource and always double check um, as you're looking to format your content in APA and properly. And last but not least, related to our discussion on Google Scholar, we do have our Google Scholar button, which is a browser plugin that allows you to access Google Scholar from any web page. Um, so as you're browsing um, the web, you can actually translate your search to Google Scholar by clicking on that browser button. Um, it does allow you to locate any full text resources. So you can see in some of my screenshots here, I can easily access a PDF um, that's open access or link out to the NCU library if it's available. Um, we can also access some of those particular tools like the save tool where I can star um, a particular resource and save it to my library. I can also access the site feature directly from the Google Scholar button. So again, this is a browser plugin and it is compatible currently with Google Chrome, um, without a doubt, and then Mozilla Firefox. So um, you can pretty much leverage Google Scholar in that way as well. Next, we're going to move on to looking at other Google tools. And we're going to start with regular old Google search. And hopefully after this presentation, you'll actually come to see you know, regular Google in a whole new light and see how you can also leverage this tool for your academic research. And while we certainly recognize the limitations and even risks of using regular Google search for research, it can be a very valuable source for locating government reports, conference papers, industry and professional standards, scientific papers, news reports, background information, definitions, and quick facts and figures. And also we'll see um, when you do a Google search, you 
actually will see results coming from Google Scholar as well. So that's another way that it integrates and you're able to link out to Google Scholar results. As with any um, search, um, like we've been saying this entire time, it's important to critically evaluate the sources that you do locate. Probably more important uh, as we make our way into open Google search uh, versus something like Google Scholar. So the emphasis is there to really think about what you're retrieving and if it is of value to you and quality resource for your academic research. One, one thing that you can do in Google Scholar is uh, refine your searches and try to get the best results by using operators and symbols. And I have a lot going on on this slide, uh, but keep in mind that this information will be included in that LibGuide we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. So uh, you'll be able to refer back to it there, both within the PowerPoint and within uh, the content of the guide itself. So we have a lot of different techniques that we can use here. A phrase search, just like we would use in a library database. We can exclude words using that a minus sign. We can find similar words uh, using the tilde. We can find multiple words using the or operator by typing in uh, or. And we can look for results uh, within a, a certain numerical range um, by using the ellipses. So we can see that our example there is Willie Mays, 1950, dot, 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 1960. And those results about Willie Mays will be coming from that specific time period. So that's a really cool trick that you can do. And we don't have time to look at examples for all of these different uh, operators and symbols. Uh, so instead, I'd like to just show one quick example here where we have searched for teacher self-efficacy scale in quotation marks. So you can see our results. We have over 37,000 results, which seems one might say overwhelming, right? But keep in mind that without those quotation marks, we would uh, be getting 26.4 million results. So that quotation search where you're looking for that as an exact phrase with no other words in between can become very important in a regular Google search. Um, and here we can see, you know, some very relevant results are coming up. We're seeing those scholarly articles at the top. We're seeing uh, what looks like a commercially available teacher self-efficacy scale. And then we're seeing results re referring to Bandura's instruments. So um, there are reliable sources here and those quotes here helped us to get there, right? In addition to those operators, uh, we do have some commands that we can use in, in a regular Google search to help us refine our results and obtain targeted results. So again, a lot going on, but feel free to refer back to our guide uh, to get back to these commands. So we can define a word or, or phrase. We can define a word or phrase by typing in define um, right there with the colon. Uh, we can look for a certain domain like .edu, .gov, .org, and you can see our example there for cybersecurity, site uh, colon .gov. We can look for web pages that link to a specific website. So we see link uh, colon www.ncu.edu, and these are websites that link to North Central University. We can find related results by typing in the word related, and we can find certain file types. So if we want only results from a PDF or a .doc or a PowerPoint, we can definitely do that. And this is a technique I actually use a lot to find reports on a, on a given topic. A lot of agencies will upload PDF versions of the reports, and uh, I use that limiter a lot uh, to limit my results to what might be a more reputable source of PDF reports. And so let's see an example from for one of these um, commands. So building off our previous search here, I've now looked for teacher self-efficacy scale, right, as an exact phrase as we did in the previous slide, but now I'm only uh, retrieving results from .edu websites. So here I've typed in site colon .edu. 
And so using those .edu websites may be a, a potential technique to lead you to more scholarly content and certainly to eliminate the commercial content coming from those .com websites. I use this uh, technique a lot as well. There are, there's also an advanced search in regular Google, um, which you can actually get to from your search results screen. So here I've done a general search for psychotherapy and under my settings drop down menu, I see that um, option for the advanced search. The advanced search has some cool features here. It allows you to narrow your search by language, region, last updates, site or domain. Um, so in, um, instead of typing in that uh, commands uh, for site colon dot edu, we can actually type that in this field here. We also have that file type search here as well. So instead of uh, typing in that command manually, we're able to choose a file format here. Um, and you can also uh, filter by usage rights. A nice way of uh, using a regular Google search is to look for primary sources. And primary sources, of course, are those that contain firsthand information, meaning that you're reading the author's own account on a specific uh, topic or event that they participated in. And in some assignments, uh, you may have a requirement to use primary sources. And probably your most familiar primary source is a scholarly and peer-reviewed journal article. But other types of primary sources include books, diaries, speeches, and also a lot of creative work such as music and videos. And we have some recommendations on techniques to find primary sources. You can use uh, terms related to your research topic in conjunction with one of the terms that you see here on the screen. Again, these will all be included in the LibGuide, so you can always refer back to it. You can type in something like, um, like digital exhibit or records or manuscripts or papers. Um, and let's look at an example so we can see that in action, right? <laughs> so here we've looked for women's history and primary sources, both as exact phrases. Uh, and that le led us to, to some very relevant results, including just a bulleted list at the top of primary sources for women's history. At the bottom of our um, screenshot here, we see um, resources on women coming from archives.gov. So already these are pretty reputable. We're seeing at least one very reputable source here. And maybe this would have come out up without our more targeted search with the quotes, but it has certainly helped us here. And it has certainly helped us by using that phrase primary sources. We can also look for primary sources by using format specific search terms. So while we were a little bit broader in the previous search and we said that we wanted to find any primary source, this takes it to another level where we're looking at a specific type of primary source. So here we might say that we're looking for photographs, letters, speeches, oral histories, correspondence, whatever that case may be. Again, you can refer to these terms in our guide because it's a lot of helpful suggestions here. And let's look at an example here as well. Here we've looked for Martin Luther King as an exact phrase and the word speeches. And these are not coming from .com websites. So now we see that our first result is from npr.org. Um, we have some other recommended uh, questions, and then we have some other articles that discuss uh, Martin Luther King's speeches. The, the benefit here is, again, nothing is coming from a commercial website. Uh, so that really has helped eliminate a lot of results that might be um, sort of leading us off the path that we initially intended. Um, and while they may not necessarily lead you in all cases to that full text uh, primary source, it's a good method of trying to get there. And please don't hesitate to contact us, you know, if you're 
feel like you're on the right track, but you're just not getting there, you know, the librarians, we can certainly help you to search Google Scholar and, and Google regular Google as well. It's not just the library databases that we can assist with. And just like we've reviewed Google Scholar, regular old Google, um, I do hope that you all take advantage of Google Books. Again, when you're searching the NCU library, you're searching books that are essentially on our virtual bookshelf, but there are so many other publications out there that can be beneficial for your own research um, that you can just either check out at your local library or even place a chapter request through our interlibrary loan service. So um, here with Google Books, you can search the full text of books and other resources inclusive of um, full text magazines and newspapers in some cases. Uh, with some of the books, they are provided um, freely by publishers and others are scanned as part of something called the library project. Um, but again, it can serve as a resource to help you learn about and browse titles that are pertinent to your research interests. Um, on this particular search page or, or image, if you will, I've done a search for grounded theory. So I'm presented with books related to my chosen theory. Um, and what's nice about Google Books is that you are able to filter by different um, access levels or access types, so to speak. So I can browse um, Google eBooks specifically or free books on the platform and things that have a preview available, um, which is a nice segue into what kinds of previews you have access to in Google Books. So um, in this particular Google product, books are displayed using different view types. And these view types are actually based on a title's copyright or the copyright owner. So in some cases, you might have a full view, which allows you to access the full text of the title, including works that are out of copyright or things that may be in the public domain. Um, you might have a limited preview, um, which in most cases, um, would allow you to access certain chapters or pages of a title, but a lot of the text may be omitted. Um, but at least it's a way for you to maybe review the table of contents and assess whether or not this book might be helpful in your research. Um, and then in other cases, unfortunately, you might come across a snippet view, which only displays um, literally snippets of a few pages of that book, maybe a couple of sentences um, related to the context of your search term within the title. Um, and then otherwise there may be no preview available and you're only presented with basic details about the title. So maybe um, citation information, maybe a synopsis of the book. Um, but in either case, it's a great way to kind of explore and discover relevant types of resources that can help you with your research topic. Um, one thing that you will find with Google Books is, is that if there is a free version available, and in some cases for those titles that are considered public domain books, you are able to download them in either a PDF format or an EPUB um, format, which you can use with a reader. So something like Adobe Digital Editions. Additionally, uh, there is an app for that, <laughs> as they would say. Um, so you can download the Google Playbooks app on either your Android or Apple device. Um, I know some of us might be a house divided. I myself am an iPhone user, um, but you can also use the app to browse different titles. And again, if things are freely available, you can browse and read them on that particular device. We also have a Google data set search. So we'll try and go through these fairly quickly to allow for some questions here. But if you're not familiar with Google data set search, it is a specific search engine that searches the metadata for millions of data sets and thousands of repositories across the web. So similar to how Google Scholar works, Google data set search lets you find data sets 
wherever they're hosted, whether it's a publisher's site, um, a digital library, or an author's personal web page. So this can really be useful um, in the sense where you know you're looking for scientific data, government data, or just data provided by news organizations. Um, and you'll notice from this screenshot that there are or, or there is a result here, but in some cases you'll see a fair amount of results presenting data from a database called Statista. And we actually subscribe to Statista through the NCU library. Um, so if there is a particular data set that you notice in this type of search, know that you can look it up and fully access that data set directly within the Statista database. We also have Google Trends, which is an interesting tool um, in itself, but it actually provides access to a largely unfiltered sample of actual search requests made to Google. So it's anonymized, so no one is personally identified, but it does um, determine the topics for specific search queries and it aggregates them and groups them together in this kind of unique infographic of sorts. So it does allow us to display interest in a particular topic, um, you know, either from around the globe or down to city level geography. But ways that you might use this tool for your own research, um, it could be a way for you to see search interest in a topic or search term over time, uh, where something is most searched or what else people search for in connection with it. So perhaps building your keyword bank right, and kind of considering how other users um, search for a topic. And we also have Google Translate. So just a quick note here about Google Translate. Uh, so throughout the course of your research, you may very well come across a resource that is related to your topic and the abstract, you know, nails <laughs> what you're searching for, but unfortunately it's written in the native language of the publication. So it's not always likely that a direct translation or copy of the resource may be available. However, you can leverage a uh, Google Translate to translate that document. Um, I will say that it's important to be mindful of translations as they can and accurately reflect the context of the work. So some texts may not translate well or may not translate as intended, but you can easily go to um, translate.google.com and you can translate certain portions of a resource by pasting content into the text box or by the same token, if you have a PDF version of a journal article that's published in a foreign language, you can actually upload that document through Google Translate um, to receive a translated file. And we've touched on a lot of things Google this afternoon, this evening, depending on where you're at. Um, but there are some other Google products that we just have not had time to discuss or review. And again, all of these are um, referred back to and linked on our library guide. But I will make note on this particular list, if you're looking for primary source documents, Google Arts and Culture might be a good resource for you to kind of search different archives um, and other historical um, organizations like museums. Um, and then of course, if you're looking for an image and are searching for permissions to use a particular image, you can always refer back to Google Images. So just a couple more Google products to add under your research belt of sorts. And last note we'll make here, so we've done a lot of discussion and provided you with different screenshots related to some of our Google tools for school. Um, however, you are welcome to join us uh, for another session and we do offer um, this session every month, Amanda and I, uh, so you can sign up for an upcoming session through our NCU library events calendar where we actually do a live demonstration 
of these tools. So this was kind of our fail safe, right? So that way browsers aren't acting wonky during our presentation, but um, please feel free to join us. And if we don't get through everyone's questions today, we can definitely tackle those at one of these other sessions moving forward. So with that, thank you all so much. And I guess we'll open it up for questions. Yes, I, I first I have to start off with um, if everyone could applaud your beautiful toddler, Amanda. She did so great. And so many people in the Q&A were like, oh my gosh, we love her. And don't worry, she's not making any noise. So thank you, um, because I was having anxiety. So that makes me feel better. Oh I was mostly worried about the water faucet and the noise. <laughs> you can barely hear it. Thank goodness okay. for the headsets. Thank so, you. so many people were saying so many nice things in the Q&A, and I just had to start with that because I am a mother of two little ones as well. Um, we had a question that was actually submitted to us via email prior to um, the webinar, and I, I want to start here. Among peer-reviewed journals on a given topic, what are two to three best ways to determine which article carries the most weight or the most validity or trustworthiness? So I'll go ahead and I'll start. Um, I think, you know, again, looking back at the citing articles, right? So if you find a really great resource, what other research has used that as the foundation for newer research? So um, again, you can use citing articles to find seminal works, those pivotal landmark studies that have been referred to time and time again in the research and really have been influential um, in a particular discipline. So it's not to say that there's a standard definition for you know, what we consider to be seminal research, right? It's not necessarily this you know, article has been cited a thousand times and that makes it seminal. You know, it could be cited 500 times, it could be cited 10,000 times, but you know, in the context of your research, you know, is there a resource that has been referenced that shows that it bears some weight? So I think that's one thing that we can kind of take a look at when considering the value of those resources that we kind of find in our evaluating. Thank you very much. Yeah, I can continue on that answer though, Emily, sorry. Because <laughs> um, you did ask for a two to three um, things that we can do. And, and so building on what Marisha said, we can first look at those citing articles. We can next um, investigate the journal itself a little bit more closely by looking at, um, first of all, making sure it's not considered a predatory journal. And so we do have information about this on our scholarly publication guide, which Marissa is putting into the chat. So hopefully everyone can see that. If not, um, there will definitely be a way for you to access it through the library, um, through our guide. Um, so looking to make sure that's not considered a predatory journal that uh, invites uh, scholars to pay to publish uh, that sort of thing. And then beyond that, um, investigating more closely the impact factor of that journal, sorry, the impact factor of the journal. So we have our traditional impact factor, and then we have uh, different impact factors or journal rankings, such as that H5 index that we saw in Google Scholar. Um, so we can move on to that as another step. Okay, great. I have another one. This is for you, actually, Amanda. It's the um, Sarah had asked in the Q&A. She's interested in that study. It was what you would, sure. if there's, should she email? How should you go about that? I'll email? put, um, we're going to create a box in our, in our guide about the presentation itself with the slides with, the, with your recording, and I'll also upload those studies there. Uh, so that should be whenever your presentation has you know, recorded um, and we get that, it'll be probably within a day, right? Yep, it's usually 24 to 48 hours max. Okay, so within the next couple of days, but definitely feel free to email me now if you want that study, I'm happy to share it. Okay, great. Um, one other question, and I, and I think that's probably all we have time for. Um, Someone was asking about if they can use Google Scholar for legal assignments. So I would recommend 
uh, speaking with your professors, using those NCU library specific databases for legal research. Not to say that you can't use Google Scholar, but again, there becomes the issue of accessing different resources and then um, kind of going back to that bare bones, right? There are a lot of powerful filters, a lot of powerful tools in these legal specific databases. And I do recommend that you harness everything that those databases offer. Um, they are subscription databases. So a lot more bells and whistles and things that you'll likely use um, in the professional landscape as well. And I think there's um, a few other questions in the Q&A, but because this um, session is being recorded and you offer your monthly one, your monthly sessions as well too, I know that um, some of those other questions will get answered through that, that forum. Um, and um, of course the PowerPoint from this presentation too, as you mentioned that you're gonna be housing your, in your lib guides section as well too. So I feel confident that we'll be able to address those questions through the, that, those forums. Um, Everybody, I wanna thank you all so much for being here today. And again, this uh, webinar will be posted in our CTL webinar section on the LibGuide page. And thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Marisha and Amanda. Thank Thanks, you so everybody. much. <laughs>